I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next program. Uh, this is a panel discussion called Adaptation with Migration. And this is a panel discussion with Artisans Beyond Borders. The Binational Artisans Beyond Borders works with embroiderers and weavers newly arrived in the US who are legally petitioning for asylum after waiting months or even years at the US-Mexico border. Through the acts of weaving, stitching, and crocheting, artisans are able to create a piece of home in this new unknown place. On this panel, we will hear the stories of Artisans Beyond Borders, their partners, and the artisans themselves. We will discover why upholding handmade, cultural, and familial arts, pre- and post-migration, is critical now to all of us moving forward. Valerie James, the founder of Artisans Beyond Borders, organized and will moderate this panel, introducing each presenter in turn. And Deborah Chandler will provide translations from Spanish into English for a couple of the speakers. Thank you to the panelists, Esmeralda Ibarra, Catherine Smith, and Sister Laika Macias for joining us for this panel discussion today. So now without further ado, I will introduce Valerie. Valerie James is an artist, writer, and community organizer. As a retired clinical art therapist, Valerie leads the trauma, led the trauma-informed arts and activities at Tucson's Casa Alitas Migrant Shelter. In addition to founding Artisans Beyond Borders, she is the lead curator for the Artisans Traveling Exhibition, Bordando Esperanza, Embroidering Hope. Valerie, I turn it over to you. Welcome to you. And Valerie, you may be muted and need to unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. <laughs> we, thank you so much, Kelsey. And we're just so honored to be here and super thankful to Warp for giving us the space to talk about what's happening now on the border and beyond. All of us on this panel are united in our mission to lift up traditional arts and their makers in the midst of family migration. Each of us recognizes the power of art to heal and the dignity in work. As many of you may know, Artisans Beyond Borders really began in like 2004 when my colleague Antonio Diegos and I, along with our neighbors and Samaritans here south of Tucson, rescued many heirlooms in the sand in the desert closer to the border. Beautifully embroidered cloths many with intricate stitching and needle weaving. Many of them carried bits of homemade food, tortillas, nuts, and seeds for the journey across the desert. And other embroidered cloths were more devotional in nature. As women, we brought them in and cared for them in the way that we imagined the women who made them would. We made an unspoken vow in our bones to do whatever we could to bring attention and respect to this work and their makers. Kelsey? As outsider artists and longtime residents of the borderland, we responded to what was really happening in our backyards in the only way that we knew how with our hands. I've included just a couple of examples in this presentation to kind of contextualize how Artisans Beyond Borders came to be. This speak this piece speaks to the reality of our lives then and now. This is a simple plain weaving I did back then and both warp and weft are ace bandages that I found one by one on the desert. Each bandage was dyed with cochineal from the Nopales cacti on my land. Woven in are thorny ocotillo branches dipped in rose, madder, and caustic. Kelsey? For the next decade, we showed the work of these anonymous artisans wherever we could. This installation called Hardship and Hope is still in permanent collections at the US, uh, on the US, at the Museum of World Culture in Gutenberg. Kelsey? At the same time, Antoni and I and other area artists, Cesar Lopez and Deb McCullough, created a life-size fiber art sculptural memorial to all those who have died in our deserts. 
These figures represented the mothers, the thousands of mothers left behind, including some who undoubtedly created the embroideries that we had recovered. These mother figures are made from found fiber left behind by people crossing through the desert, denim, khaki, and burlap mixed with desert plants. Along with the Migrant Shrine Community Memorial at Southside Presbyterian in Tucson, Las Madres, No Mas Lagrimas, No More Tears, stands to this day on what some call now sacred ground at Pima College in Tucson. Slide. In the extreme desert heat, the natural resins and beeswax we used to seal the fibers with rose to the surface and the mothers wept. They articulated the grief in our community in a way that words could not. Slide. In 2007, we met our first family of Bordadoras, embroiderers, farm workers who had just been deported to a medical tent in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, which the medical tent was put together by US volunteers. The embroidered servietas that they carried with them had held tamales for their ill-fated journey across the desert. It was when they shared their craft with us, how it was passed down from mother to daughter in their family for as far back as they could remember, that they began to feel safe and smiles came easily. Slide. Flash forward to 2018, volunteering at Casa Alites, Tucson's lead migrant shelter, where traditional cultural and familial handwork became an essential part of our trauma-informed arts and activities. Slide. In 2019, we began taking donated embroidery supplies to Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, and facilitating groups for asylum seekers waiting for months on the streets and at resource poor shelters. At the end of our panel discussion, I'm happy to share more about what's happening now with Artisans Beyond Borders. And here I'd like to introduce Esmeralda. Uh, I don't have, unfortunately, the bios. So Deborah or Kelsey, if you could read the uh, paragraph bios from our flyer, that would be fantastic. And then I'll jump in. Deborah, can you, do you have the, the bios in front of you by any chance? My screen is filled with the, the PowerPoint. I don't. Okay. I'm sorry. I can. Same, same here. My screen is full too. <laughs> uh, maybe since the the um, published bios are, are fairly formal, Valerie, can you just uh, sort of introduce each speaker with with your relationship to the person and um, and just a, a brief general introduction? I think would be okay since the longer bios are published on the website. Absolutely, and and I would really encourage people to check out the website. Esmeralda, can I see uh, Esmeralda on the screen here? She needs to unmute herself and say something to appear. Esmeralda necesita abrir su, su volumen y decir algo para estar visible. Hola a todos, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes para Guaracá y buenos días para los que están en Tucson. He's saying hi everybody and welcome. Good afternoon for those who are in that zone and good morning for those who are in the early time zone. It was during this time in 2019 and early 2020 that we met Esmeralda on the streets in Nogales and she became one of the incredibly talented artisans in our group that we worked with in Nogales. Kelsey? Here we go. Here's Esmeralda in Nogales. Hi. And here's Esmeralda safe now in the US. Slide, please. Esmeralda, please tell us your story 
How did you come to Artisans Beyond Borders, Deborah? Esmeralda, por favor, cuéntanos tu historia. ¿Cómo llegaste a los artes, las artesanos más allá de las fronteras? Pues yo llegué ahí mediante la, el día de esperas en Nogales. Uh, cuando yo vi que llegó una camioneta con un grupo de, de americanos y repartiendo, regalando el, el material para abordar las mantas. Entonces yo me acerqué y... Y formé parte de ellos. Okay, espera, espera. So I was in Nogales and a camioneta of an SUV showed up with materials for the for the embroiderers. And so I joined the group. Uh -huh. Y entonces pues uh, cuando ellos me entregaron el material yo empecé a abordar y para mí eso fue un gran apoyo. Fue y será siempre un gran apoyo. So they, I received the, the materials that they delivered and I began to embroider and this was a huge support for me, a great support. Y pues, eh, cuando estamos bordando las mantas, eh, nos concentramos ahí mientras esperamos el asilo para no estar tan triste. When we were working on the embroideries and making the mantas, the, the little cloths that we were making, this was a great way to concentrate on what we were doing while we were waiting for asylum. Entonces, pues muchas gracias a Artisan Bello por el apoyo que nos brindó en la frontera y pues acá también. And so, a huge thanks to um, the to the project for 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 Artisans Beyond Borders for the support there and now also that I'm in the United States also. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, slide, next slide, please. Esmeralda, can you tell us about the embroiderers and the weavers in your family? And how is your embroidery influenced by the designs that we see here? Esmeralda, puede hablarnos de los bordadores y tejedores en su familia? ¿Y cómo se ven influenciados tus bordados por los diseños que vemos aquí? Bueno, pues mi familia se dedican a bordado. Mi madre, que en paz descanse, y mis hermanas han sido las personas que empezaron a bordar y nosotros pues seguimos, seguimos en este mismo para que son trabajos que hacemos, se podría decir, de generaciones en generaciones. My mother was an embroiderer and she taught me and my sisters, my sisters and I were embroiderers and this is work that we have done generation by generation. Y con el trabajo de la artesanía, pues de ahí podemos solventar nuestros gastos porque pues ya las ventas se van a, a otros países, a otras ciudades. And so the work that we did is what supported us financially. Our work went to other countries and we sold it locally also. Pues yo solo puedo terminar diciendo que me siento muy feliz y orgullosa de que mi madre me haya mostrado algo que para mí es muy importante. And I, and I would finish that by saying I'm very grateful to my mother for giving me something that has been so valuable for me. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, I want to say before we move on to the next slide that today I'm wearing one of these beautiful repeals that um, Esmeralda's family made. You can see on the side here of the slide these beautiful flowers and how they're replicated on her niece's wedding dress and also in, Esmeral in Esmeralda's embroidery itself. Next slide, please. Esmeralda, you must miss your family very much. Do you feel that your embroidery honors the memories and keeps your indigenous cultural traditions alive? Esmeralda, debes extrañar mucho a tu familia en México. Sientes que tus bordados honran sus recuerdos y mantienen vivas sus tradiciones culturales indígenas? Sí. Sí, la verdad sí extraño mucho a mi familia, extraño mis costumbres. Eh, y sí, la verdad, todo este trabajo que lo estoy haciendo es para honrar 
honrar mis costumbres, tradiciones y como una mujer indígena. Yes, yes, of course. I miss my family a great deal. And it's definitely the case that my embroideries and this work are memories, help my memories and also are, are done to honor my family and the traditions. Next slide. And the next slide. Now that you're living in the U.S., Estados Unidos, how are you adapting your embroidery to the U.S. market? Ahora que vive en los Estados Unidos, ¿cómo está adaptando su bordado al mercado estadounidense? Pues ahora que estoy aquí en Estados Unidos y como sigo bordando, uh, yo me siento muy contenta, me siento muy satisfecha con mi trabajo porque eh, siento que estoy avanzando más con, 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 mis, con mis bordados y cada vez me ten, estoy tratando de hacer otro tipo de diseños más adelante. I'm very content being here in the U.S. I'm continually working and trying to get better and do better, and I'm and I'm changing my designs to adapt to the market, to what to the tastes of the Americans. Next slide. Oh, Esmeralda, do you accept commissions now? And and what do you love to embroider more than anything else? Ahora que vive en los Estados Unidos, oh, no, aceptamos encargados y qué es, es lo que más te gusta bordar? Lo que más me gusta bordar son las flores y ahorita también lo que más me gusta son las imágenes religiosas. More than anything, I like weaving, I like embroidering flowers and religious symbols, religious figures. And ¿Y está you, aceptando car, encargos? ¿Quiere hacer trabajo para alguien en particular? Sí, si sí, se presentará la, 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 ahora sí el pedido, sí, sí, sí esto, eso me dedico al 100% con mi trabajo, entonces uh, no tendría ningún problema en caso de que tenga un pedido. She said, yes, yes, I'd love to do commissions. Um, I'm dedicating all my time to embroidery. And so, yes, I, if somebody has an idea that they want me to do, I would be happy to do it. Which is gracias, Esmeralda. And, and I'm Valerie, can they, if somebody wanted to do a commission, can they contact her through you since we're not saying where she is? Yes, absolutely. And I'll speak a little bit more about that after okay. Okay. For sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just off the cuff, um, one of the things about Esmeralda is uh, she's such a leader amongst all the women, and she's um, been very involved in the Save Asylum movement. And I was wondering if Esmeralda would like to say something about that. That's off the cuff. Esmeralda, um, ahora usted está casi una activista, entonces. Valerie está preguntando si quiere hablar un poco del trabajo que está haciendo con el grupo con quien está trabajando y luchando. Sí, claro, claro. Este, pues aquí seguimos. Eh, en, en ocasiones me invitan a reuniones eh, de allá de Nogales, Sonora, México. Eh, solo pues yo, yo igual lo único que que yo les pido a, a, a todos nuestros hermanos que están en la frontera, que tengan fe y que tengan esperanza, de que hay que luchar en hasta donde se pueda. Si trata de reuniones, aquí estamos. Tuve la oportunidad de, de, de ir a Washington DC el año pasado y apenas en abril fui a Cincinnati también a hablar sobre lo, el tema de, de asilo y sobre el título 42 y cómo está afectando a nuestros hermanos en la frontera. ¿Y está es, esas reuniones son de Zoom? ¿O no, cómo está? En Washington DC tuve personalmente. Ok. 
En Cincinnati también estuve personalmente con los estudiantes de la Universidad de Alexander, Alexandro, ¿cómo se llama, no? Alexandria, ajá. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, so she's, she is working with a group that is, that is involved in immigration issues, Title 42 and other things like that. And um, she tries to give as much encouragement as she can to the people who are still in Nogales and, in, and on the border saying, you know, keep at it, stick at it, something will happen. She went to a meeting in Washington, D.C., talking about immigration issues, and she talked with students in a university near there and has been active in a number of ways, bringing up the issues. Y pues voy a, voy a seguir en la lucha. Si me invitan otro, otro grupo, otro equipo, ¿por qué no? Para eso estoy, soy una persona que también defiende un poquito de los derechos. Uh -huh. So she's, she will continue doing this kind of work and anybody else who wants her to come and speak, she'll be happy to do it. She's definitely interested in, in rights and how the laws are affecting the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, muchas gracias. Okay, next slide, please. These are actually some of, this is a recent commission that I know of that um, Esmeralda has done for an Episcopal minister. And uh, the next slide, please. And um, this is such a beautiful piece, oh, the detail. And this is a Eucharistic adoration, just gorgeous. Thank you so much, Esmeralda. Next slide, please. And I, this is to introduce Kat Smith. Um, and this is actually Kat with Esmeralda in Nogales in 2020. I have a lot of respect for Kat. When I first started volunteering with Casalitas uh, in 2018, Kat was the first person on staff that really recognized how critical it was to have art supplies in the budget for our guests. And throughout 2020, and 2021, when the pandemic was at its height, Kat was the one who crossed the border each month to deliver our donated embroidery supplies and also pick up the artisans finished work when we older volunteers were unable to. Next slide. And Kat, are you here? Yes. Yes. Kat, could you tell us a little bit about your background in Guatemala? Yeah. Um, so hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Um, so I right now I work with, it's called Mennonite Central Committee. Um, but in 2017, I volunteered with MCC, Mennonite Central Committee. Um, and I lived for a year in Santiago, Atitlan, um, which is... Um, kind of a city town outside of the capital. Um, and this is a uh, um, indigenous Mayan town and community where they speak Sutuhil. Um, so I had the opportunity to live with a host family who you can see on the screen. Um, that's about half of who I lived with. Um, and I was able to um, volunteer at a woman's co-op called Anadesa. Um, so there were about 20 women or so in the co-op um, and my host mom was actually the president of the co-op. You can see her sitting in the middle. Um, her name is Juana. Um, and so the um, group Anadesa would offer kind of workshops and trainings every month. And then I would go with my coworkers um, who I was working with, we would go and do kind of um, house visits once a month. and. It was just a very empowering group. Um, in fact, the name of the group for the women was Mujeres Proactivas or Proactive Women. Um, and so, yeah, I um, yeah I lived with this family. Um, she has five children, so, sorry, seven children, um, five of whom lived at the house while I was there. Um, and she was also a single mom. Um, and so she had to work to sustain her family. Um, so many people in the town of Santiago Atitlan, um, they create this kind of small um, beaded handiwork. 
And then they also embroider. Um, so a lot of the women embroider the wheat peels. Um, so kind of the blouses, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then in that town, a lot of the men do the um, kind of backstrap or weave um, weaving for the cortes, the skirts. Um, so pretty much all day, my host mom um, was either tending to her children, the kitchen, or working on these beaded items or embroidering. Um, and so personally, I don't know how to embroider, um, sadly, but either way, you know, I can say that um, she, Juana, my host mother, um, and many others in the town have a lot of skill and a lot of expertise um, in what they are creating. So I think... Um, yeah. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> That's perfect. I was going to say in this picture, you can see specifically, um, they use a lot of purple um, in that area. And then also a lot of um, birds, a lot of small birds. Um, and so, um, yeah, I feel like during my time, I was living along expert weavers and embroiderers and just kind of got a sense um, for that, that um, skill. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is another woman. She was part of the co-op as well, Concepcion. Um, and you can see her, um, yeah, weaving there. And that's at Ana de Sa, the co-op. Next slide. And then this is a group of um, most of the women who were part of the Mujeres Proactivas, Proactive Women. Um, so you can see um, all of them, you know, that's just their, their normal attire, um, all woven probably by themselves. And then in the background, you can see kind of um, little beaded items placed there. So they gifted me that necklace and earrings that they had made. Beautiful. Uh, next slide, please. So Kat, can you tell us how working with artisan asylum seekers speaks to your heart? Yeah, and you can see I'm in the same place in my office. Um, so the words that kind of come to my mind um, that are in my heart are, are hopeful and healing and inspiring. Um, I think the nature of my work, I work a lot with asylum seekers here along the border. Um, and I accompany people who are seeking asylum, whether they're in Mexico or in the US. Um, and teach people mainly from the US about the US immigration system and asylum and the border. And so I, you know, I fully recognize that I am not someone who has had to migrate, um, has not been forced to leave my home. Um, and for the most part, I've, you know, lived, have had a stable living space. Um, but to accompany people and to have this job that's heavily affected by, you know, immigration policies it can be taxing as well. Um, so honestly, when I think of who I work with, with the embroiderers, um, it's honestly to have an aspect of my job and even my life where I get to work alongside the artisans who are like reclaiming their autonomy and who are healing and empowering themselves. And it's a source of hope for me. So what really speaks to my heart is like the determination and the power that each artisan has to not let the asylum system like swallow them up and just spit them out, but to witness people who are finding a way to make beauty um, physically and emotionally um, in such an uncontrollable environment. Um, so it's, yeah, something that I'm proud to be a part of. Um, and just overall, it gives me hope um, and just honestly seems like a natural like the most natural way to combat this kind of human-made, um, human like arbitrary system. Um, so again, yeah, just beauty that is kind of like being forced upon um, and confronting kind of this, the immigration system that we have right now. Thank you so much. That's a big question. Next slide. Can you tell us how your work has evolved and changed from when you first started volunteering with Artisans Beyond Borders before the pandemic and to now in 2022? Yeah, um, so I first started working with Artisans Beyond Borders. Um, when I first started, it was um, a little more simple and organic and sometimes chaotic, um, but like Esmeralda said, 
um, we would kind of yeah pack up materials, drive them an hour to the border from Tucson um, to Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. We would just set up some tables on kind of like a concrete football um, or soccer field. Um, and then women and families would just kind of naturally um, crowd around to come up, come pick up materials. Um, and then they would also kind of later on, once they would start to make the embroideries, they would then um, like hand them off to us. Um, so when they had a finished piece or finished work, um, and then we were able to give a financial donation. Um, so there, there was kind of this process happening at the same time where people were choosing materials um, and others were turning in their finished work. Um, and sometimes it did kind of seem stressful to me with all of these people coming. And I think especially, you know, this was right before um, the border closed, which I'll get to in a second. But in that, in, in, in that environment, it's kind of um, the sense of scarcity. Like if I don't push my way through, I won't, um, I won't get it. And I think that was influenced by the uncertain, uncertainty of the environment at the border. Um, but overall, as I like reflected on this question, I think there's also, again, I wanna just say a lot of autonomy and agency in that process to be able to pick out colors, pick out the materials that you want to use because almost nothing else in this situation waiting at the border, are you able to pick things for yourself? Everything is, is decided. So I just wanna say that. Um, but um, yeah, so like I said, we would go about once a month, bring materials, pick up materials, and then COVID started um, and the border was just closed. And it was really as um, Artisans Beyond Borders and Bordering Hope was gaining momentum, I would say. Um, and so then, yeah, there was really no way for people to enter the U.S. Um, so and that's still pretty much like in place right now. The asylum system has really been dismantled. Um, but yeah, I didn't want to, to stop going, didn't want this to just kind of die. And so with the help of Valerie and other volunteers, they started instead of just laying out the materials, we would pack the materials or a team would pack materials um, and then we, I would just kind of take them and I would speak with the coordinator in Nogales and we would kind of at the beginning do this drop off um, where we would meet at a parking lot, um, kind of like no contact. Um, and we would meet at a parking lot of a, like a supermarket. I would take, you know, pick up the mantha cloths that they had embroidered and then give her the materials. And then as time progressed, you know, we learned how COVID spread and we could be a little more safe in our interactions. Um, so then for, I don't know, almost a year, it seems like would go down, would go to the shelter, which you'll hear about in a second. Um, and every time I arrived, you know, I would kind of spend more and more time just speaking with the women who are embroidering. But once I entered that shelter, everywhere you looked, people were embroidering. So I think it's really a testament to how healing this was for people and how it gave them something to do and is still giving people something to do while they wait um, for this. Um, and one of, yeah, I'll just finish with one of the, the my favorite things. It's It can take a really long time to enter the US when you're leaving from Mexico. And so my favorite thing every time after I would spend a day um, I would sit in the line in my car and just pull out the bag and look at all of the mantha cloths um, that the that I had just picked up from the women. That was like, it was like a special treat that I was the first person that got to see um, all of the work that they did. Um, yeah. And also, oh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, that's a good example of the, the mantha cloths. Next slide. Can you tell us about your new role coordinating uh, many of the US-based artisans now and, and how you hope to see that develop? Yeah, so um, thankfully, kind of a core group of women who were waiting at the border in um, Mexico for a year or more um, were able to enter the US. Esmeralda is um, one of them. And so um, 
we are instead of only now working with people who are waiting at the border, we are kind of doing this follow up and continuing to work with um, kind of the, a group of about 10 women right now and their families, um, some are families. Um, so we met them while they were in Mexico. They are now in the US. Um, thankfully have been able to reunite either with family or with their sponsors. So people who are receiving them. Um, so what we're trying to do, I'll try to do this as simple as possible. Um, one is really connect them with their new community. So either connect them to a church or a community group or um, a group of individuals, um, a small group that are interested in supporting um, the, the embroiderer. Um, and then we're also planning to, once they kind of have established host community, um, we're hoping to plan an exhibition. So you can see all of these Manta cloths um, with Valerie's expertise, we were able to hang them um, and create like an, an exhibit, an exhibition to showcase um, a lot of the material that was made during this time of 2020, 2021 of waiting in Mexico. Um, and so this show has already began to travel um, and Esmeralda was able to host a show. And so with, along with the exhibit, we're hoping that um, whoever is kind of the host um, receiving the, the exhibition in their community that the embroiderer will be able to then also present and share their own experience with Artisans Beyond Borders with Embroidering Hope like Esmeralda has done with you. Um, and so we're working on still kind of set, um, setting the host communities and then also with like dates and things like that. Um, so we're looking, you know, a year, two years in the future for to, to kind of rotate and go throughout the US to visit each embroiderer in their home, their new hometown. Um, and yeah, uh, I think it's our hope um, that they would also be able to network um, as Esmeralda was saying, you know, she's taking um, orders, I guess. So we're hoping that people would also gain kind of a clientele where they live um, so that they can kind of um, branch off from us and find support um, and really, you know, be entrepreneurs in their new um, settings. And lastly, we have some funds um, from different organizations, different grants. And so along with um, setting people up with host communities, we also have um, you know, finances that we can offer to help that community um, pay for things like um, legal fees um, or you know, helping them to pay the fee to even apply for, apply for a work visa um, and things like that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one of the women in our group. Okay, next slide, please. So you're still working binationally, Kat. And, and here you're, you're at the makerspace, uh, Las Disenadores Estudio at the shelter at La Casa de la Misericordia y Todas Naciones with Sister Lika holding up some of the Bordadora's work completed at the shelter. Next slide. And this is Sister Lika, who has been an active supporter of the arts and artisans beyond borders since 2020, when she became the director of the shelter and many of the embroiderers that worked with artisans beyond borders arrived seeking shelter. It was a really difficult time. Next slide, please. Sister Lika, are you here? Sí, aquí estoy. Buenos días. Buenos días para nosotros. Buenas tardes para ustedes. Yo soy este, Alma Angélica Macías. Me dicen Lika, directora del Refugio Casa de la Misericordia y de todas las naciones. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where you are. For us, it's morning. And it's, it's nice to be here. I am Sister Lika. My name is Angelica, but Lika is what we call me, Macias. And I'm the director of the, uh, ¿cómo se llama otra vez? Su, Casa su de la Misericordia y de todas las naciones. The House of Mercy and United Nations, or Nations United. 
Sister Lika, can you describe the shelter and the property for us? And also how many families you have there right now uh, waiting for asylum? So can you kind of set the scene? This is an amazing place. Uh, hermana Lika, ¿puede describirnos el refugio y la propiedad y cuántas familias tienen allí ahora mismo esperando asilo? ¿Puede darnos una idea en general cómo es, cómo sí. es el escenario? Sí, el, el nuestro refugio es una, como una grande comunidad. Actualmente tenemos 134 personas. We have Nosotros, 135 people now. It's a, it's a great and large community. Nosotros recibimos familias completas, mujeres solas con hijos y mujeres solas. We have complete families, single mothers and single women. Eh, de, del 2021 a esta fecha, hemos atendido 889 personas que han pasado con, asilo, con la búsqueda del asilo a, lo, a, a los Estados Unidos. 800, ¿qué? 889. 889. Since, okay, since since we began with this project, we've had 889 people and families coming through that we have helped. Las familias que aquí llegan son personas que son perseguidas, eh, están perseguidas por extorsiones, desplazamientos forzados. Nadie deja su, su casa porque quiere. Todos, the, su vida mm -hmm. corre peligro. The people who we have here are all people who are persecuted. They've either been threatened with extortion, they've been forcibly moved off their land, they've had other kinds of traumas like this, and nobody leaves their home because they want to. They're here because they are because it's because they have to run. Y los habitantes que hemos tenido son de Centroamérica, de diferentes partes de Centroamérica, de yeah. México, de Haití, Cuba. Venezuela, Colombia, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Ecuador. Y hemos tenido ahorita, está aquí un ruso. Whew. So the people we have here are from Central American countries, numbers of them, some South American countries, Haiti and Cuba and, we, and Mexico, of course. And we now have one Russian here. Wow. In uh, 2020, when you first met the embroiderers who had been working with Artisans Beyond Borders in Nogales, what did you think? Or what did you observe about the embroiderers? In 2020, cuando conociste las bordadoras que habían estado trabajando con Artisanos Beyond Borders in Nogales, ¿qué pensaste? ¿Qué observaste en los bordadores? Para nosotros, El, el que haya llegado Katy y Valerie a, a la Casa de la Misericordia en tiempo de pandemia es, fue una cascada de colores. ¿Cascada de qué? De colores. Ah, de, ah. When, when Kathy and uh, Valerie arrived with all of the, the materials for the, for the program, it was like a waterfall of colors. Para nosotros fue una bendición que hayan llegado porque estábamos precisamente, había aproximadamente 300 migrantes en la casa porque se habían cerrado los demás albergues. The other albergues, other shelters had closed. So we had 300 and some people in our shelter and them arriving was a true gift. It was a wonderful thing. Nosotros tenemos una organización comunitaria, tenemos un, jar, un, un huerto de vegetales, tenemos escuelita, tenemos espacios para hacer el pan, horno, pero la parte de los bordadores llegó a darle color a, todos los, a todas las familias. So we have ovens for baking bread, we have gardens, we have a variety of projects and spaces here, but when the, when the embroiderers arrived, they added color to everything. Para ellos era un tiempo con dignidad, unidad, solidaridad y esperanza. For them, it was a time of dignity, hope, solidarity, and one other thing I forgot. Dignidad, esperanza, esperanza solidaridad, solidaridad y, uno más. y unidad, unidad. And unity, and unity. 
Y esa foto describe mucho porque ahí se daban diálogos, conversaciones y sonrisas en, en cada momento. This picture is representative because it shows them smiling and working and being together in this moment. Sí, yo no había visto a los hombres que bordaran y ellos aquí bordaban, bordan todavía los hombres. Before I had never seen men embroidering, but here, yes, they were embroidering also. Se ofendían cuando les decíamos, las mujeres que quieran bordar, y ellos decían, ¿y nosotros? ¿Cuándo? Uh -huh. She said, and we, it all began, and, and, and they, we think that the women are going to do it. And they said, and us? Y eso también fue como, además de ser esa unidad, era una, una fuente que ellos podían estar ganando dinero con lo que ellos estaban produciendo. In addition to all the other benefits, this also gave them a chance to earn some money with what they were doing. Y, y bordaban historias, bordaban flores, paisajes, bordan lo que se les viene a la mente. They embroidered flowers and scenes, but also stories and whatever came to their minds. La convivencia de diferentes países hace que se abra el horizonte. This opened their horizons. Gracias. Next slide. Sister Lika, Amana Lika, you have created a maker space at the shelter for the artisans to come in from the elements. Why is it important for the residents of the shelter to sew, weave, or embroider? And in many ways, I think you've just answered that question. But could you tell us a little bit more? Hermana mm -hmm. Lika, ha creado un espacio para hacer cosas en el refugio para que los artesanos entren desde los elementos de los elementos, elementos. ¿Por qué es importante para los residentes del albergue coser, tejer o bordar? Y ya contestó en una manera, pero puede sí. ampliar su, sus ideas un poco, por favor. Sí, el espacio es para el mismo, el mismo trabajo del bordado hace como que enriquezca una espiritualidad y una forma de ser y estar. This, this space is not only a space to create embroidery, but it also is a space for spirituality and for opening more sensations. Y hay quien prefiere estar en un espacio concreto, hay, en aislamiento, como es este espacio, ahí vemos las que están cosiendo, Cecilia que está con el telar de cintura, son como espacios sagrados. This is like a sacred space. They're working on all of these things and it's a sacred space for them. Gracias. Next slide. And the next slide. Next slide. Sister Lika. You've initiated many beautiful murals throughout this two acre compound. Can you tell us more about how you see the role of the arts and the health of the community at the border, at the shelter, excuse me, specifically? Uh -huh. Hermana Lika, ha iniciado muchos hermosos murales en este complejo de dos acres. Puede decirnos más acerca de cómo ve el papel de las artes en la salud de la comunidad en el refugio? Las artes han sido, como ya lo he dicho, con la misma, el bordado. Es como, los, como entender que los sonidos y los silencios en una espera que a veces es prolongada, se convierten en, hablan de una manera muy concreta esos sonidos y silencios. So, so what happens here is that in the, in the space that they're working, there are sounds and there are silences. There are spaces of silences. And those sounds and silences say a great deal. Las imágenes para ellos siempre son como una ventana lo invisible. The, the images for them are like an invisible window. Y eso 
lo puedo transmitir yo porque lo vivo día a día. I can say this because I live with it day by day, every day. Next slide, please. El, el, que los, el que los habitantes, los residentes participen en, en huellas que dejan en todo el albergue es muy importante. Huellas como... Improntas, uh -huh, sí. sí, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. eh, si yo veo los ojos de estas mujeres y de estos niños que están aquí, Verlo es una cosa en una fotografía, pero vivirlo directamente es una experiencia que, que no se puede encontrar en otra parte. She's talking about what it is to be with them to see this. We can see them doing this in the picture, but she said to be with them is just a remarkable experience. And they're leaving their footprints or handprints, but she says their eyes are bright and they're absorbed and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank Aquí you. lo que han vivido, el dolor que están sufriendo por ser despatriados, por ser eh, desplazados, se les borra y empiezan a darle color a su vida. So when they're working on this, they begin to be able to let go of the terrible things that have happened, that they have lost their homes, that they have been displaced and with the colors they're beginning to paint their new life basically. Ayer se fueron unas personas me han dejado esta cartita este dibujo son maneras de expresar lo que ellos vivieron y para mí es muy fuerte. Aquí tengo por ejemplo esa mariposa me la acaban de dar esta semana. Ese bordado también es regalado por ellos. Quieren dejar algo aquí. Y esos otros trabajos que hacen es parte de lo que ellos viven en el refugio. Next slide, please. So, okay, wait a second. These, so what they, she was just pointing to were gifts that people have given her. Their drawings, there's an embroidery, there was a, a dream catcher. And she said all of these are gifts to her yes. that the people have given them um, to, show, to show their gratitude for this better life in the refuge for the moment. Next slide, please. There's the mariposa. Yeah. Esta es la mariposa monarca, el que simbólico para los migrantes. Es la mariposa que migra y en ella se reflejan. Aquí estamos en proceso del mural que tenemos en una de las paredes nuestras. He said, this is the monarch butterfly that migrates through there. And it's a great symbol for them of migration and what it means. And then, and then there is the map showing their paths of migration also. El día que concluí esa mariposa, la mariposa monarca, curiosamente, llegó en la noche la migración de la mariposa y descendió sobre los árboles. Pasaron una noche... Fue una experiencia para todos de se nos erizaba la piel. She said the, the day that they finished that painting of the of the monarch butterfly, that night in the night, the migration of monarchs arrived and filled the tree. And she said it gave us goosebumps. It was just a remarkable, precious, incredible experience. Sí. Gracias. Next slide. Valerie, I just want to um, let you know we have about five minutes left. You mean for everything? Yep. Yes. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, the next slide, um, uh, this is an example, in the next slide, of one of the youngest Bordadoras at the shelter. And could you tell us just a little bit about this little girl? Puede decirnos un poco sobre esta chica. Sí, ella, este, este, en esos días nació una hermanita de ella aquí en el albergue. Ella estaba un poco celosa y andaba muy inquieta. Y una de las señoras le dijo, ven a bordar. Y la niña se puso a bordar y fue para ella. Dice, no sabía que podía yo hacer estas cosas. Y se le olvidaron los celos de la hermanita. Y ella continuó a bordar y a bordar. Dijo, haré para mi hermanita un vestidito. Ah, so this little girl was living in the shelter and her mother had another baby and the girl was very jealous of the baby and began to be very restless and not comfortable. 
And so someone said to her, come and embroider with us. And she was amazed to find out that she could embroider. And it changed her entire outlook on life. She began to be happy and feel good. And she said, this embroidery that she's holding up is to make a little dress for her new little sister. Es una nena. Sí, es un, yeah. Sí, sí. Yeah. Which is Gracias. I guess we'll have to um, run through Sister Lika's uh, slides of her be own beautiful work really quickly. If you could do that, Kelsey, um, just go ahead. Trabajos que han hecho, sí. This is beautiful work at the shelter that some of it is for sale. Go ahead. Yes, um, hermana Lika, ella se está mostrando las, las sí. dispositivos rápido por los, porque... Tiempo. Exacto. No tiempo. Uh, exactly. uh, and here's a Guadalupe. I wish we had time to go into this. This is an amazing painting Sister Lika has done. And I just want to say that in case we really do run out of time, that Guadalupe is the spirit behind all of our work, behind this entire project from the very beginning. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Since the beginning of the new year, um, as Kat said, uh, Artisans Beyond Borders has embarked on a new course during the height of the pandemic as people were stranded forever on the border and were really having a hard time keeping the faith. We began to see more and more devotional embroideries, bordados devocionales, that eventually became this national exhibition of their own. It's a rare window onto the experience of migration and family displacement through the eyes and the hands of the women and some men living it. And I wanna say uh, that this ex exhibition has been curated by all the volunteers of all the Friends of Artisans Beyond Borders, like seven women in like perfect consensus, which is rare and amazing. <laughs> Next slide, please. We've shown in Arizona, in California, at USC, and in Ohio so far this year. Our priority is for the exhibition to be shown first in the communities that the artisans have settled in. That way the artisans can represent their own work, as Kat said, in their own voice, and hopefully be able to cultivate the relationships and the support that they need to augment their ability to make a living with their work if they wish to, like Esmeralda has done. Next slide. Esmeralda has a wonderful advocate through her church who is also now helping to facilitate her commissions. We found that having an advocate who can function as an artist representative for them, at least while they're getting on their feet, is really the key to success. To have that personal attention and encouragement from someone who's more familiar with language and the US marketplace is everything. Next slide. There are so many skilled arts facilitators just among the membership of WARP and in our audience at large today. If you would like to be a cultural arts sponsor and work with individual artisans directly, email us, contact us at artisansbeyondborders.org. We all bring whatever skills we have to the table and we help the best we can. And you don't need to know the language. You can do almost everything on text and Google Translate and I can testify to that. Next slide. Donations to our Artisans Beyond Borders Makers Fund go directly to foundational expenses for the US-based artisans like these work permit. Uh, they're really expensive. The Makers Fund also helps to ensure that this essential programming can continue at the shelter in Nogales while the residents continue to wait indeterminately for asylum. Next slide, please. Uh, even though their contemplative handwork is oftentimes the closest these families will ever get to any kind of psychological well-being, funding for arts programming on the border or anywhere uh, in the U.S. is little to non-existent. And here at the shelter, the servietas at the residence embroider are used daily at the table and here also to cover fresh bread and tortillas baked in this outdoor oven, this orno, once a week to last everyone at the shelter throughout the week. Next slide. This last slide is a manta that was embroidered by an indigenous weaver at the shelter that you saw earlier, Cecilia. Uh, she's the weaver who's recently featured in a story on Warp's blog. I often wonder what would have happened to her had she had no way to be able to weave. 
the only thing that she knows. Before she found a way to weave, she would cry herself to sleep every night at the shelter. She had waited almost a year there for a chance to apply for asylum. Would she have finally given up and made that fateful decision to cross the desert with her children? Would they have died in the desert like thousands of others? It's organizations like Warp and Mayan Hands and Baskets of Africa and Cacao in Guatemala and so many here that are working to make life sustainable for families so they will not have to migrate. This is what gives me hope. But for those families forced to migrate whose roots are ripped away from the land, there's little that is more important than protecting and respecting their cultural and familial touchstones. This is the work of healing, anima mundi, the world soul. As it's so often said, if we are not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. The truth is that every time we in this country do not support the traditional arts of these source countries, we are actively participating in yet another extinction event around the world. Next slide. Here are ways that you can directly support these artisans here in the US and on the other side of the wall. And we can send these later or you can contact us and I'll send them to you right away. Uh, next slide. And I just want to say also, on behalf of everyone in this panel, we want to thank Kelsey, our coordinator, for everything she's done to put together this amazing program, and Deborah Chandler for translating, absolutely essential. We want to thank all the members of the Board of Warp, and mostly, we want to thank all of you for being here and supporting these initiatives around the world that are working to move the needle forward. Thank you.